This is the first of us. This is the first of a series designed to hang together with additional content from two guest speakers who will address the intersection between eating disorders, health equity for those who are Black and African American and LGBTQ, and the additional challenge of eating disorders among those who have experienced trauma. Join me in welcoming Therese and take it away, Therese. Thank you very much. Let me start to share my screen here. <clears throat> so thank you both Kathleen and Sam for the warm introduction. And thank you to the Oregon Health Authority for sponsoring this series. Eating disorders is what I've been doing almost exclusively for the past 20 years. I started as an advocate. Um, did that for several years, moved into more training and more training and advanced training. And in 2009, opened up my own private practice, which has been very rewarding. It's also challenging. So I'm very happy to share things that I've learned over the past 20 years with all of you. And I appreciate your interest. <coughs> so first, um, on the web page are links to these three booklets. These are all booklets produced by the Academy for Eating Disorders. <clears throat> I'm a member and also a fellow of the Academy for Eating Disorders. It's an international group devoted to best practices and research and advocacy for people with eating disorders and their families. So you have links to all of these. And I'm going to be referring to these throughout this series. So <clears throat> the first one here is the AED guideline for medical care. In this, you will find uh, repeated the diagnostic criteria. And this is sort of the cliff notes of medical complications. So I will refer throughout this series to various medical complications. And I will direct you to certain pages in this booklet. Also same with the nutrition, um, the guidebook for nutrition treatment. <clears throat> we also discuss the various types of eating disorders, nutrition treatment for those, the intersection of therapy with nutrition therapy. Um, we discuss uh, medications and how they interact with nutrients and also can produce side effects, both desired and undesired. So there, this is also a rich source of information. And finally, the AED produced this guide to selecting evidence-based psychological therapies for eating disorders, which you will also find useful. So I'll be referring to these, grab them when you can, take a look at them, <coughs> excuse me. And I'll be referring back to these throughout this series. So let's look at our learning objectives for today. We're going to learn, first of all, what are eating disorders? How has new research informed us of what eating disorders are and how they're defined? <clears throat> we will look at the current diagnostic criteria, so the DSM-5 for the various eating disorders. We'll learn how multidisciplinary teams function, and I'll be referring back to the function of multidisciplinary teams also in the August lecture. <clears throat> we'll learn about the high-risk groups for development of an eating disorder, and then we'll learn how to use two validated screening tools that you may find useful to use in your places of work. Um, I know I've lectured at health departments and schools and often uh, mental health specialists in those locations do like to provide screening for eating disorders. So we'll look at a couple of validated tools. <clears throat> so this is an area I find particularly exciting. I've seen such a huge sea change in the thinking of what eating disorders are over the past 20 years. They are being defined very differently by current research than they were 20 years ago. 20 years ago, 
and be even before that, even more oddly, they were considered a personal choice. They were considered maybe um, being employed by someone because they were vain and they just wanted to be thin. Um, sadly, years ago, they were, con they were once called a rich white girl's disease. That's pretty sad. So new research <clears throat> really tells us that eating disorders are a type of anxiety disorder. More and more, we're seeing research pointing to the fact that eating disorders exist under the broad umbrella of anxiety. And when I'm doing education with families, I bring this up frequently. Eating disorders also have a biological basis. They're partly inherited, so there is a genetic aspect to them. And they're partly due to differences in metabolism. And I'll touch on this today. Eating disorders <clears throat> may be defined by the current diagnostic criteria in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual version five. So we refer to that as the DSM-5. I'm sure you've all used this. And then different groups, different international groups, advocacy groups have also defined eating disorders um, based on how they see eating disorders appear. So we'll just look a little bit at that. <clears throat> so let's look at the evolution of thought about what eating disorders are. So a huge part of this evolution has entailed moving from blame to education. We used to blame people for having an eating disorder. Why can't you just eat? Well, we've moved away from that school of thought. Now we're educating people. We're getting them in touch with their inherent personality traits, some of the genetic aspects, getting people in touch with what has made them anxious. I can tell you, <clears throat> I've seen hundreds and hundreds of eating disorder cases. And there's not a single person I've ever seen with an eating disorder who isn't anxious. We're now involving family as well as the social network. We finally have realized, and this is really becoming mainstream, that people don't recover from eating disorders in a vacuum. They don't recover by themselves. They need the involvement of families and supportive others. And so in August and September, when I'm talking about treatment modalities, we'll delve into this more. How do we involve family and in supportive others? We're beginning to treat eating disorders like any other illness. Again, years ago, we used to sort of isolate a person with an eating disorder. Other illnesses, types of cancers, you know, diabetes, there's a huge social network of support around those illnesses. So people with eating disorders need this as well. <clears throat> New research is pointing to some fascinating biological metabopsychiatric etiology of eating disorders. And I'm gonna to touch on this in the next couple of slides. <clears throat> metabopsychiatric. What does that mean? It really is the intersection of our metabolism, genetic differences in our metabolism, and how that actually impacts the workings of our brain and therefore our psychiatric profile. So again, eating disorders are considered a type of anxiety disorder coupled with metabolic dysregulation. So I wanted to show you this. This is the nine truths about eating disorders. This was produced for World Eating Disorder Action Day, which is now annually on June 2nd. But <clears throat> this came out, it was sort of a, many different advocacy groups produced this. And these are still widely cited. So let's look at these nine truths. Many people with eating disorders look healthy, yet can be extremely ill. That's a very important point. None of us can just look at a person and say that person has an eating disorder or does not have an eating disorder. So looks can definitely be deceiving. We have to dig in and start asking some questions or screening. Truth number two, families aren't to blame. 
and can be the patient's and provider's best allies in treatment. And this is also new thinking. I've seen just a huge amount of change around the involvement of families. Even 10 years ago, and even today, I still do hear some clinicians say, well, the family is the problem. Sometimes it may appear that the family is the problem. And we can discuss this during the Q&A, ask me about this. Um, but in general, we don't blame families. An eating disorder diagnosis truly is a health crisis. So once that person has a full DSM diagnosis, it is considered a health crisis. <clears throat> and yes, it, it disrupts the person's personal life and it disrupts the family's life to a great degree because going back to truth number two, we are involving family in the treatment. Eating disorders aren't choices. And I think this is important. And so many people with eating disorders are so glad for this because in the past it was considered a choice. Again, the why can't you just eat attitude. And it's not that simple. It's not a choice. It's a biologically influenced illness. Eating disorders do affect all kinds of people, all kinds. Once again, 20, 25 years ago, people would sadly say, oh, this is a rich white girl's disease. Besides the inherent yuck of all that, it's, you know, it's just that that really reflected the state of knowledge at the time. So eating disorders affect all types of people, all ages, all races. Eating disorders do carry an increased risk <coughs> for both suicide and medical complications. The medical complications can be severe. Um, in August, I will touch upon some of those, but the medical complications really are those that you see in Frank's starvation <clears throat> often. And then the risk for suicide is heightened because being with an eating disorder isn't fun. It's not desirable as was once thought. Um, people with an eating disorder really feel a great deal of torture because of it. <clears throat> Genes and environment play important roles in the development of eating disorders, yet genes alone don't predict who will develop an eating disorder. And finally, this ray of hope, full recovery from an eating disorder is possible. The key ingredients to full recovery are early detection and early effective intervention. And I still hear from so many providers, they'll say this to a patient, oh, this is something you're gonna to have to struggle with for the rest of your life. It sort of gets back to the kind of addiction thought process. <clears throat> And in the eating disorder world, we don't say that. You, we don't start out treatment with such a negative thought of, oh, you're gonna have this for the rest of your life. I know many, many, many people who have fully recovered. So eating disorder research, <clears throat> I just wanted to touch on this kind of metabo psychiatric uh, aspect and the anxiety aspect. So here's a paper, and I'm happy if some of you have an interest in delving into this in greater detail than we have time to during this lecture series. We can put some very recent papers on the neurobiology and the metabopsychiatric etiology up on the website. But here's a quote from this paper. We hypothesize that eating disorder clinical phenotypes may result from stress-induced maladaptive alterations in neural circuits that regulate feeding. So again, stress is there and stress, you know, we realize stress is bad for many things. It's bad for our immune system. It's bad for us being able to cope with life. And stress is, we're finding out, it's very bad for some of our neural circuits. It changes them. It alters how we process things like leptin, even insulin, and maybe even some of the macronutrients like glucose and lipids. So, and then, yes, let me just proceed. Oops. Okay. So then let's look more at anxiety 
And then we'll look at this next slide, which is on metabopsychiatric disorders. So I wanted you to have this little handout from the Academy for Eating Disorders about anxiety. I think this is often a good thing to use when you're doing psychoeducation. So anxiety is a normal emotion. No kidding. We all have it at times. In some people, it becomes severe, persistent, disruptive. And that type of clinically significant anxiety is often what we see hooked up with eating disorders. So that type of clinically significant anxiety is what starts to um, alter neural circuits. Anxiety and eating disorders isn't just about food and weight and shape. It can be more generalized anxiety, often present before you see signs of an eating disorder. The eating disorder behaviors often develop to mitigate the anxiety. People with eating disorders who also struggle with anxiety, which is most of them, <clears throat> also tend to have personality traits that make them sensitive to making mistakes, taking risks, and coping with change, uncertainty, and novelty. So we'll talk more about these personality traits in the August and September lectures. High anxiety tends to be seen in childhood, even before the onset of an eating disorder, and it can worsen <clears throat> once the eating disorder begins. Often in adolescence, there's this perfect storm of new hormones, changing body, increasing anxiety, but almost all the parents and families I've worked with said, this kid was kind of born anxious. So we do see, so where does this anxiety come from? Some people are naturally anxious. And it's thought that epigenetics contributes to that. Other people, and there is a paper also on the website about adverse childhood experiences. So this is where the environment comes in. Some kids may start out without a lot of anxiety, but then they inherit anxiety from the environment. So something happens, some trauma happens, adverse experiences, their anxiety increases, thus making them prone to developing an eating disorder. People with eating disorders often, usually, experience anxiety before, during, and after eating, which can cue the eating disorder behaviors. Eating disorder behaviors such as restriction, exercise, and purging may provide short-term relief from anxiety. So often people with anorexia nervosa are genetically predisposed to feeling calm when they restrict. <clears throat> and so people are right now teasing out the genetics and the neurobiology behind that. Anxiety in people experiencing an eating disorder doesn't occur because they aren't trying hard enough or because treatment isn't working. It's rather what has happened to their brain. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the fact that trauma, anxiety, it kind of causes that part, that primitive part of your brain to light up and it can stay lit up. And of course its function is to save us from, from being eaten by a saber toothed ti tiger. But now if the anxiety is malplaced or coming up, because of past incidences, um, disordered eating behaviors, you know, aren't working always to quell that anxiety. And so it's really important. And I do hear clinicians get frustrated that treatment isn't working and they get frustrated with the patient if they could just do thus and so, but realize you're working with a pretty traumatized brain um, and an anxious brain. High, the higher the level of anxiety, the more difficult treatment is. And then exposure therapy is often an effective treatment for people with anxiety disorders, but it can be harmful for some people at different ends of the weight spectrum. And we'll talk about this more when we discuss treatment. Okay. So I mentioned this term, metabopsychiatric disorders. I find this area of research extremely fascinating. So look at this, caloric restriction has been shown to re 
program stress and or exogenic pathways. So restriction of calories reprograms stress. And remember for people with restrictive eating disorders, restriction tends to make them feel calmer. Caloric restriction also reprograms orexigenic or appetite stimulating pathways. So caloric restriction in and of itself interacts with stress to do something different for the person. Highly palatable foods like those high in fat or high in sugar are known to induce alterations in behavior <clears throat> to maximize consumption. Isn't that fascinating? I know Cynthia Buick, who's a researcher at Duke University has often said, sometimes you need to reset your sweet stat is how she put it. But it's also interesting that highly palatable foods such as these are high fuel foods. And for some people, their stress may signal pathways that they need more fuel. They need to run away from that saber tooth tiger. And so for some people, the stress works differently. So for people with restrictive eating disorders, the stress tends to tell them to eat less. That calms them down. For people with binge type behaviors within their eating disorder, the stress tends to say, eat more, eat more of this. You might, you might need it. There might be some danger here. And let me just give you another example. Um, more theories are coming out about how stress alters the reward pathway and how people are really different genetically in terms of how they perceive reward from food. <clears throat> so imagine you've just had a nice long hiking day, you're pretty tired, you're really looking forward to dinner, you order yourself a nice good sized dinner and you're really hungry, you've been hiking or working in the garden all day. <clears throat> and so you start to eat that meal and just, those first few bites are highly rewarding. We've all had those situations where we're super, super hungry. And the first few bites of a meal are so rewarding. They're just lovely. And as we eat the meal, as you get towards the last few bites, the perceived reward diminishes. And that's actually the normal course of a meal. The beginning part of a meal, more highly rewarding than the end of a meal. There's a theory that those with binge eating disorder don't diminish their sense of reward as they eat a meal. So imagine eating that nice big meal after your hiking day, but feeling just as hungry and as in need of food at the end of the meal as you did at the beginning of the meal. It's a really interesting thing to think about. And so those are just some highlights of this whole new area of research. And I've had many people with eating disorders say, you know, when I learn about this stuff, it really makes me feel so much less blamed. They, they feel like both in treatment and from family members, they're somehow to blame for their eating disorder. And then they learn about this type of thing and how genetics, the environment, stress, their metabolism are all working towards having them adopt these behaviors that somehow at the end of the day, are there to mitigate some of that anxiety. <clears throat> so now let's look at the diagnostic criteria. So Anna, and these are just straight from the DSM-5. So this is DSM-5 diagnostic criteria, restriction of energy intake leading to a significantly low body weight. I'm gonna come back to the low body weight here because this is perhaps a weakness of this particular criteria, restriction of energy intake leading to a significantly low body weight in the context of age, sex, developmental trajectory, and physical health. <coughs> you might replace low body weight with leading to a significant weight loss or fast rate of weight loss. Also, there's an intense fear of weight gain even in people who are underweight. So that's what you see in anorexia nervosa. There's a body image disturbance, undue influence of body weight and shape on self-evaluation. 
So these are people where their feelings of self-worth self -worth are highly influenced to a great degree by body weight and shape. And there's also a denial of the seriousness of the current low body weight or rate of weight loss. Um, agnosognosia is a key feature of anorexia nervosa. Agnosognosia is um, lack of insight into one's illness. And we see that all the time in anorexia nervosa. So these are the diagnostic criteria. Here's the ICD-10 codes for that. Bulimia nervosa, <clears throat> recurring binge eating episodes characterized by the following, eating a large amount of food within a short period of time, and usually the short period of time is considered to be about two hours, and also a sense of lack of control, reoccurring <clears throat> inappropriate compensatory behavior. So these are the purging behaviors, self-induced vomiting, laxative abuse, excess exercise is a purging behavior, use of diet pills, binge eating <clears throat> and compensatory behaviors occur on average at least once a week for three months. So once a week for three months. And again, self-evaluation is heavily influenced by body shape and weight. <clears throat> so bulimia nervosa has features of both anorexia nervosa being that self-evaluation is heavily influenced <clears throat> by body shape and weight, and also features of binge eating disorder, which is feeling the lack of control during a binge. And then ARFID, this is a newer diagnosis in the DSM-5, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. And this is a really interesting one. <clears throat> It can sometimes look like anorexia nervosa, but it isn't. What are the differences? So this is an eating or feeding disturbance so pervasive that the person is not able to meet appropriate nutritional needs. It results in one or more <clears throat> of the following, significant weight loss, nutrition deficiencies, dependency on nutrition supplements, or interference with social functioning. So sometimes people with ARFID don't like to eat in public, don't like to eat with others. The problem with eating is not explained by lack of food being available. This is different from anorexia and bulimia in that the problems with eating are not related to the way the person thinks about their size, weight, or shape. So this is a key difference. I've seen kids and adults with ARFID and some of the presentations. I had one child who experienced an accidental poisoning and she went through a period where she was just vomiting almost uncontrollably. She was already an anxious child, been anxious forever, her parents said. And so this, of course, just added to her anxiety. And then she was afraid to eat because she was afraid to vomit. And she was afraid of the sense of fullness to the point where she was becoming dehydrated. Her pediatrician referred her to me because she was dehydrated. And so we started, we did like exposure therapy and we started, my first prescription was four ounces of water every 90 minutes throughout the day. So we had to address dehydration first. We had to, eight ounces of water was too much. Four ounces I knew would dissipate quickly. <clears throat> So four ounces of water every 90 minutes. And from there, we started to build in foods. Anyway, ARFID is really interesting. It presents very differently. Some people with ARFID have what's called selective eating disorder, highly selective eating. So these people may eat 12 or 15 foods and that's it. It's, and yet amazingly, if you do a dietary analysis of their eating, um, they're eating enough, they're eating adequately. They're, they don't have nutrient deficiencies. They might need a little bit, like maybe a vitamin, but they're highly selective eaters. It's very interesting. Um, so this whole avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, very interesting set of problems. And then finally, binge eating disorder is also a new uh, 
<coughs> disorder in the DSM-5. Again, similar has some overlap with bulimia nervosa, recurring episodes of eating a large amount of food. And this is an objective large amount of food. So we often say there's subjective binges and objective binges. So somebody with anorexia nervosa will think they binged if they eat a sandwich. Okay, that's a subjective binge. Most of us would not look at a sandwich and say, yeah, that's a binge episode. Now, I've had people with binge eating disorder who, yes, they'll eat several pizzas, half a gallon of ice cream. I mean, it's objective. Most of us would look at the amount of food eaten in a two hour period, say, and agree this is a large amount of food. Um, eating rapidly, eating beyond fullness, secretive eating <clears throat> are all hallmarks of binge eating disorder. Um, people experience a lot of shame and guilt. And there is a sense of lack of control over eating during the binge episodes. So they feel like they can't stop eating or control how much they're eating. And again, great sense of shame and guilt. But again, the brain of people with binge eating disorder, met the metabopsychiatric aspect, your brain may be telling them you need to fuel up because danger is afoot. Okay, and then binge episodes average at least once a week for three months. <clears throat> and here are the ICD-10 codes for that. Other diagnostic criteria include those for OSFED or other specified feeding and eating disorder. This is where the eating disorder behaviors <coughs> are present, such as binge eating, but they may not meet the full criteria, such as the frequency for one of the previous categories. And then also some people put atypical anorexia nervosa here. Um, Atypical anorexia nervosa is anorexia nervosa seen in somebody who has a larger body. I don't know if I would put it here. I think some people, and this is what is often missed, is some people start out at a higher weight. They start to develop anorexia. They have the thought processes and fear of weight that somebody with anybody with anorexia would have. They lose weight very quickly. I once saw a young man, he was five foot 10. He started out at 235 pounds. He took a health class. He was pr a pretty anxious person, but this health class was the final straw. It scared him to death, it shamed him. They had people counting calories and calculating their BMI and so on and so forth. And so he started restricting, he got down to like 145, 150, which might be an okay weight for a man at five foot 10. All the doctors missed it because his BMI was not dangerously low. So this is a very common problem where we miss people who true, and he had, he wasn't atypical. He had full-blown anorexia nervosa. Um, he just was not at a low weight. So I see the DSM-5 evolving to get rid of the low weight part and moving into rate of weight loss or amount of weight lost over time. And then you fed unspecified feeding or eating disorder. Here we have eating disorder behaviors present, but there's not enough information to make a diagnosis. So Sometimes a doctor will diagnose you fed. They say, you know, I'm hearing this patient report on eating disorder behaviors, but they need more evaluation, usually with a, a therapist or somebody who's an eating disorder specialist. And then orthorexia, this isn't really a DSM-5 diagnosis, but it is something to pay attention to. So people with orthorexia are often very perfectionistic. <clears throat> they limit foods or they have a lot of food rules, usually with the idea of being healthy or eating perfectly, whatever that is, there really isn't a thing like perfect eating. Both orthorexia and diet bulimia are terms adopted by the lay press, currently not recognized as official diagnoses. Diet bulimia is a term given to people who manipulate insulin in order to lose weight. 
So a lot of people with diabetes learn that if you withhold insulin or inactivate your insulin, that results in weight loss. That of course is a really dangerous thing to do. So I've already mentioned there are some weaknesses that have been recognized in the DSM-5 criteria. One is that weight really isn't as important a factor. It's important to follow weight over time. As a clinician, I'm a nutritionist. And so of course I follow weight because it's sort of a barometer. It's like a proxy in some cases of what's going on or gives me an indication of how people are eating. But <clears throat> I don't think it's the be all and end all when it comes to diagnosing an eating disorder. I think weight loss over time is more important. And then also just the behaviors in binge eating disorder and bulimia nervosa, you might not see changes in weight at all, but you still see people just really involved in behaviors that are damaging to them, that are in interfering <clears throat> with their life and their lifestyles. Um, so just really evaluating those behaviors and we'll look, more, we'll look in more depth at behaviors, specific behaviors in the August and September lectures as well. And then also these diagnoses are not stagnant. People do morph from one diagnosis to another during the course of their life. So let's look at screening for eating disorders. I think this, this is the first important practical tool I'm gonna to give you. Later, we'll look at, um, well, I'll talk in a minute about what we're gonna look at later, but I think screening is really important. Even if you're not an eating disorder specialist, you know, I think almost any person can do these screens. They're very simple. So it's important because as we said earlier, full recovery is possible if eating disorders are detected early and effective treatment is started early. So the research is abundantly clear that that's the case. The sooner you find out that an eating disorder is present and the sooner effective treatment is started, the better the prognosis. There are high risk groups to consider for screening, which I'll show you in a second. And then screening might point you toward those individuals with concerning signs and symptoms, but who don't yet meet full criteria and we can still intervene. There are uh, protocols being developed for uh, prodromal anorexia nervosa, for example. <clears throat> so here are th the high-risk groups. There are probably some more, but this is what I have. So adolescence, the main period for onset of eating disorders is between the ages of 12 and 25. Women, as they go through major life transitions like pregnancy and menopause. And so remember, if they have a significant amount of anxiety in their background, some of these transitions can be the straw that breaks the camel's back. You know, also they're experiencing changes in their body. And we live in a pretty toxic universe when it comes to how we view bodies and standards of beauty and so on and so forth. And we'll be going into more of that during this series. Women with polycystic ovary syndrome or diabetes, both of these conditions are heavily involved in metabolism. So again, body changes can happen. Differences in how people process macronutrients can happen. All of this can lead people to want to change their body. And people with type one diabetes are really at risk if they're, they're using insulin and they figure out, oh, if I microwave my insulin or something, it's not effective. I mean, it's been shocking to me to see the clever ways that people can manipulate insulin in order to lose weight. But then of course their blood sugar skyrockets and that's just a really dangerous state. Athletes and people engaged, <coughs> excuse me, in competitive activities and other activities <clears throat> where body shape and weight may be perceived as affecting performance. Um, I can't tell you the number of adolescent athletes I've seen who really, they've been told even by coaches that 
if you're thinner, you'll be faster. And then of course we have sports like, um, what am I thinking? No, weightlifting, um, wrestling, where weight and making weight is, is just important to the sport. People with a family history of eating disorders, because genetics is part of this, people frequently asking for weight loss advice and chronic dieters. So if you're a clinician and you interface with people and they're always talking about weight loss and dieting and you see people yo-yoing back and forth in terms of their weight, that's a red flag. And then men and boys, this is a pretty overlooked group. In fact, just recently, maybe three, four years ago, I had a young man come to me and he said, my PCP looked at me and said, what are you doing with a girl's disease? Shocking, I find that shocking and it's sad. And this is why men and boys often refrain from seeking treatment. So I'm gonna introduce you to these two validated, these are validated screeners. The first one is the eating disorder screen for primary care, and you'll have be able to retain this on your slides. This is also in both the medical care booklet and the nutrition guideline booklet from the Academy for Eating Disorders. So you'll see these screeners repeated there. So the ESP, two abnormal responses, gives you a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 71%. So it's pretty sensitive for screening out the possibility of an eating disorder. It still means we need to do a further evaluation. So here are the five questions. Are you satisfied with your eating patterns? No is considered an abnormal response. Do you ever eat in secret? Yes is considered an abnormal response. Does your weight affect the way you feel about yourself? Yes is an abnormal response. Have any members of your family had an eating disorder? Yes is an abnormal response. And finally, do you currently suffer with or have you ever suffered in the past with an eating disorder? Yes is an abnormal response. Well, you can see where it would screen out pretty effectively. I almost find it, it's interesting that third question, does your weight affect the way you feel about yourself? And again, the last lecture of this series in December, we're going to get into weight stigma and weight bias, because I'm sure, as you all sense, we live in a pretty fat phobic universe. Okay, the scoff <clears throat> is another eating disorder screener, which has been widely used for years. It's also sensitive, yes, to two or more of these questions. Um, warrants further evaluation. So the first question, do you make yourself sick because you feel uncomfortably full? Do you worry you have lost control over how much you eat? That's actually the second question, it wasn't bulleted there. Have you recently lost more than one stone in a three month period? I had to learn what a stone is. A stone is 14 pounds. This was developed in the UK. And you can see where scoff came from. It came from these underlined uh, first letters of these words. Do you believe yourself to be fat when others say you are thin? Would you say that food dominates your life? So again, a yes to two or more of these warrants further evaluation. So those are the two screeners. They're pretty simple. Take a look at them. Go back and look at them in the AED booklets. <clears throat> okay, so what are we going to do next? So what do you do if you screen? And I've been saying so further evaluation and treatment. So one of the things we want to do is evaluate the dietary intake. You probably need a nutrition expert with eating disorder training to do it. People who do have an active eating disorder learn pretty quickly how to be evasive when it comes to questions about food, but we definitely have to do a dietary intake. So because people can lose their appetite and lose a significant amount of weight 
and still be taking in 4,000 calories a day. And why might that be? So this is, so it's important, do the dietary intake first, find out, get a picture of what a person is actually eating. Because people might have a GI cancer, they might have um, some kind of malabsorption syndrome. So they could have different things that make it so they're not absorbing what they are eating. So evaluate the dietary intake, look at weight loss and weight gain history, exercise history, evaluate attitudes about food and weight. And in the next lecture, I'll give you some tools to look at that. So a good dietitian with, who's an eating disorder specialist can usually do all of this for you. And then you need to also evaluate mental status. Again, um, in the next few lectures, I'll be giving you some, some of the common tools for this, such as the EDEQ. Again, I think it's good if you are already familiar with eating disorders. If you're in this training and not familiar, getting more training is available. So we are getting training through this series. There's also other ways to get training. Um, you can join the Academy for Eating Disorders or the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals if further training interests you. <clears throat> and then we also, the third prong is we have to evaluate medical status. Does this patient need inpatient refeeding? Are they at risk for refeeding syndrome? Do they meet hospitalization criteria? So again, pages six through nine of the AED Medical Care Standards Guide will, will give you more information about these things, um, but it's not appropriate at all to start therapy with somebody if they are indeed at medical risk. And like we said earlier, you can't just look at a person and if their weight appears normal, you can't say, well, I don't think they're at medical risk. No, people at high weight, normal weight, low weight, they can all be medically compromised due to how they've been eating. So, and again, in the next lecture, I'm gonna get into the nuts and bolts of this. And then we need to discuss with the multidisciplinary team the appropriate level of care. And we'll talk about levels of care also in August, but it is important, I find, to have a team. And so usually a multidisciplinary team is comprised of uh, the therapist or mental health specialist, the dietitian, and the medical doctor, and sometimes a psychiatrist. And we all are sharing information back and forth. The medical experts, so sometimes people with eating disorders because of severe anxiety um, or severe obsessive compulsive disorder, I don't think I mentioned that in the restrictive eating disorders, almost 65 to 70% of those people have diagnosable obsessive compulsive disorder. We've already talked about how anxiety can be extreme and you do see this on a spectrum with everybody has anxiety that has an eating disorder. With some people, it can be quite extreme. And so then sometimes the psychiatrist will prescribe um, an anti-anxiety medication and it can help people, especially during the first phases of treatment. Once the person has been cleared medically, so sometimes people do have to be hospitalized to be medically stabilized for outpatient treatment. Sometimes once they're out of the hospital, they may see their medical doctor less. Although I'm very much in favor of, if I'm working with adolescents, <clears throat> I want them to still see the pediatrician or the family practitioner <clears throat> once a, every week or two weeks <clears throat> because the doctor has a lot of credibility. And there's something about, especially with adolescents, if they need to see the doctor on, <clears throat> excuse me, a regular basis, that tends to reinforce to them that there is a problem. It's a serious problem. And that's why the doctor is still there. And the doctor can reinforce the messaging that the therapist and dietitian are giving. 
often the therapist and dietitian are doing, I would say the bulk of the work, seeing the people most often and doing a lot of the behavior change work, which we will get into in August. Oh. thought there was one more slide, but so we are pretty much done. We're a little ahead of time, <clears throat> but I think that's good because it'll give us more time for question and answers here. This is Kathleen. If um, we could continue to have the questions in the chat. I have a couple people I need to answer individually, and I am trying to categorize the questions so we can maximize the Q&A time. So um, I think we could all take a few minutes um, for a break. That was a lot of excellent information that is um, challenging to wrap your head around, even if you have some familiarity with eating disorders. And so um, take a few minutes to um, think about any questions you may have. If we run out of time for questions, we will have an additional question and answer session toward the end of the series where we can cover any other questions that we don't have a chance to cover during the normal series Q&A. Thank you for your questions and I'll continue to um, respond to people and take some notes. And I'm also, if people are curious about cases, you know, I can highlight some cases such as the ARFID case I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> which was very fascinating. And I have another ARFID case that was with a 10 year old boy, so fascinating. He was a highly selective eater and uh, just amazing. So thank you for everyone's attention. Oh yeah, the last slide was just our Oregon Health Authority ID slide. <clears throat> and sorry for my coughing. I live in the Willamette Valley where the pollen count is now so high and I'm having I'm allergic to pollen. So yes, thank you for also being patient with me, <clears throat> clearing my throat due to allergies. Super fun. This is Kathleen. I'm going to say one more thing because there have been a lot of questions in the chat about how do I get CEU? I didn't sign up for CEU when I registered. What do I do now? Um, what you do now is that you email Sam Haskins at sam.l.haskins at dhs oha.state.or.us. I will put that in the chat for you and let her know that you want CEUs. You have to have attended the entire session today from 12 o'clock until 1.15. These are the requirements of the NASW who is authorizing the CEU. And you have to stay through the end of the Q&A session to get your CEU. You also have to fill out an evaluation form that Sam will be sending you, which is why she needs to know that you want CEU if you didn't sign up for them. Thank you for uh, those questions, and we will not include those in the Q&A. Well, what questions do you have? <clears throat> Give me one minute and I'll be right with you. Hang on.
I'm sorry, Teresa, I thought I was unmuted. Let me try that one more time. The first section of questions had to do with anxiety and the connection between eating disorders and depression and or trauma, and also in how to um, address eating disorders in treatment when it's obvious that there is a lot of anxiety. Well, in treatment, and this is what I've learned from my colleagues in mental health, <clears throat> it used to be thought that you should treat, like if the person does have verifiable trauma or PTSD, it was once thought that you should treat that before the eating disorder. It's no longer thought that. It's really thought, let's co-treat these conditions, use medication if you need to, um, realize that in eating disorders, there's always going to be anxiety there. I've asked so many clinical psychologists that I see. I've done kind of a back of the hand short poll of some of the top psychologists that I know. And I said, have you ever seen a person with an eating disorder who didn't have anxiety? And they all say no. And now there is research out of the um, uh, University of California, San Diego, Walter Kay's research and Christine Weinringa's research that really shores up the fact that eating disorders are a type of anxiety disorder. So you have to treat both. Sometimes it becomes helping the person realize, well, first of all, if they're still in a dangerous situation, like a domestic violence situation, that has to be attended to, of course, otherwise the anxiety will continue. Um, <clears throat> if whatever caused trauma has resolved, if, it was, if the anxiety arose because of trauma, then working through the trauma, some people use EMDR or other ways to deal with the trauma. I will even say in sessions, even though I'm a nutritionist and sometimes we're talking about food and the anxiety has landed on food and weight concerns, even though there may be another origin of the anxiety, I will say to people, tell me how you know you're safe. So bringing people back to a grounded place, a safe place is important. So there are some people for whom the environment caused anxiety, trauma caused anxiety. And so those things have to be dealt with separately, but concurrently with the eating disorder. Eating disorder treatment always involves cessation of eating disorder behaviors. So as you're working with trauma, still having the person eat, because not eating actually magnifies anxiety. Having low blood glucose is an anxious state. So we want to bring the person back nutritionally. That way they can actually engage in therapy better. <clears throat> so, and both you know, nutritionists use a lot of behavior techniques such as, I mean, I think most healthcare providers use some type of CBT, also acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, and we'll talk more about specific techniques, but I think you have to treat both things concurrently. And then there are the people for whom they were just sort of, I call it born anxious. The parents who come to me and say, you know, this kid had these OCD looking tendencies, even at age three, they had to line everything up in their room or they've always been harm avoidant, um, didn't like taking risks. And so again, I think good therapy can help kids manage that anxiety. It's like, yes, it's there, but how do you manage, manage it? When does it come up more so? Um, you know, what can you do about it? So, and all of us these days are managing some degree of anxiety. So I think there's kind of two different groups that I see the one group where they're kind of born anxious and they have to learn to deal with this personality trait. Some may need medication. So a psychiatric evaluation. Then there's the group that truly has experienced a high degree of ACEs, trauma. And so you have to 
work them through that trauma, and yet at the same time insist that normalized eating start to happen. And so, and we'll get into this more so in August, like what, what is normal eating? How do we make that happen? What kinds of supports can make that happen? Therese, this is Kathleen. And there was an additional question about, are there any mental health meds that are recommended specifically for treating anxiety associated with eating disorders? Did you wanna say anything about that? No, not specifically. I'm not a prescriber. I think in the next couple of lectures, I can pull up some of the commonly used meds. <clears throat> um, you know, some of the anti-anxiety meds that are often, that I see prescribed, you know, Prozac, Fluoxetine, um, Seroquel used to be used for, to get kids through like the first phase of eating disorder treatment. It can have some bad effects on blood sugar values, <clears throat> but also in the nutrition guidebook, we have this wonderful, let me direct you there, the nutrition guidebook has a whole table and we developed this table with the expertise of psychiatrists. We, and the table lists commonly used meds in eating disorders, what the effect is supposed to be, what are they used for, <clears throat> what might the nutrition consequences be, and then what are the undesired effects. So it's this whole table, it's in the nutrition care guideline booklet that you have a link to. So I would look at that because that also gives you some idea of the types of meds used. But again, I'm not a prescriber, so I don't go there frequently. I will look up though for our August and September lectures, you know, what are the popular things being used today? Some of the meds like Lexapro, <clears throat> treatment centers will use for a short period of time because weight gain is a side effect. The downside is a lot of people with the eating disorder will look up the medication and if they see weight gain as a side effect, they'll put up quite a fight. So sometimes you see that happen. Okay, we have a whole series of questions about diagnosis and um, I'll start with the first one. Can a person be diagnosed purely from their own subjective report or does there need to be objective reporting to go with the patient's report? So purely subjective report, I think there does need to be objective data <clears throat> such as the dietary intake, weight loss, weight gain history, some medical objective data such as hormone levels. So medically you see things like thyroid hormone dysfunction, sex steroid hormones usually lower. So, there, so I think having that to back it up. However, also just going with the behaviors which are mostly self-reported, but sometimes if it's an adolescent, you can also utilize the parents, which I do quite frequently. What are they seeing? I will often meet with parents separately to get their insight. So does that answer that? I think it's a combination of both the self-report and you'll see when we look at some of these measurement tools, like the eating disorder examination, um, that people, you know, they are self-reporting. Okay, second related question uh, regarding diagnosis. Does ortho orthorexia meet the criteria for obsessive compulsive disorder? I don't, you know, it could, it could. Orthorexia is, again, it's kind of on a spectrum like we've probably all known people who they're, they just wanna eat clean. Clean eating has been like a media thing recently. And so you've got your clean eaters. Are the, do they necessarily have OCD? Maybe not. I guess it would depend on the degree of <clears throat> rigidness, the degree of anxiety. So orthorexia just by itself 
like I said, it, it encompasses a pretty wide spectrum from sort of your garden variety clean eater to somebody who's extremely, you know, obsessive about eating, um, maybe mixed in with components. In fact, I just did an intake with a family on a 14 year old boy. And toward the end of the intake is when they said, oh, he's also germophobic. He's really afraid of getting germs through food. So food has to be cooked to a certain temperature. He's obsessed with pull dates. And then I went, oh, okay. And, and he kind of fit criteria for ARFID, but again, I suggested he be evaluated by a pediatric psychiatrist for OCD. So I think orthorexia by itself, no, but it certainly is a red flag for that. And certainly there can be overlap. Thank you. Um, there's another question about the age. Um, what's the most common age you see in eating disorders emerging in children and youth? I've seen people from ages eight to 80. Um, and yeah, I, I think the common age in youth is uh, so for anorexia nervosa, maybe 11, 12, 13, 14. It can also be older though, because maybe a triggering event is going to college. That's another hot spot. You know, leaving home, going to college, being exposed to all the diet mentality at college. So um, yeah, but I think with kids, what I see frequently is 11, 12, 13, 14 for first emergence of anorexia nervosa, a little older for bulimia. Sometimes kids start out with anorexia and then they learn purging behaviors. One of the most, the most common purging behavior that goes along with restriction is over-exercise, which of course is often praised in our society. Oh, look how healthy the person is. They're, going to the gym for four hours a day. Yeah, well, and that's when I pay attention to parents when they say, you know, this just isn't my kid. I mean, it just doesn't feel right, their obsession. Or 10 o'clock at night, they're supposed to be going to bed and the parents hear this pounding in their bedroom and they go in and the kid is just doing push-ups, you know, or, or sit-ups like a wild person. Okay, we had a couple of questions about screening. Um, can anyone complete a screening or does it need to be a qualified mental health professional? For example, could a teacher complete a screening and refer to a therapist? I would say yes. I think anybody can do a screening. If you, these are very simple questions. It doesn't imply that you're going to start treatment or make a diagnosis. So I would say yes, a teacher could do that and then refer to a therapist for the further evaluation. Okay. Next question, is the scoff screen only for losing 14 pounds or could it also be positive if a person gained 14 pounds? That's interesting because it does say losing, but I would say, um, you know, if, and the gaining of 14 pounds, I guess it's like, hmm, is, are we saying, is that pathological or not? So I think it's tends to be tilted a little towards screening for anorexia nervosa. Um, but yeah, I would just stick with the scoff questions as they are. Because I think the other questions within the scoff, if you, two of those showed up positive, um, I don't think it's been, then, then you would refer on for further evaluation. I don't think it has been evaluated within the context of weight gain. Thank you. There were several questions related to whether or not there is a referral list available for primary care practitioners who are either overwhelmed or unable to take on any more eating disorder patients in Oregon. Do you have any information about that? A referral share? list? A referral mm -hmm. list for treatments? Well, 
I think it's in our next lecture. We've been working on what we call regional. We have like a regional list of treatment centers, providers, groups, pl places where you can get um, advice or help. In fact, I've got another one is up and coming. I'm working with Douglas County and we're gonna have I think four of us sort of be consultants to people, but if you're if you are talking as a PCP who's overwhelmed with the number of cases, we have definitely seen the number of cases of eating disorders go up during the pandemic because the pandemic has increased stress on so many different levels for people. And actually everybody I'm I'm in touch with people worldwide um, as part of AED everybody's overwhelmed. I'm sorry. Everybody is overwhelmed. Almost everybody is full. We're, you know, people are trying to get more resources, make more room, but we will have a list. <clears throat> In fact, we could probably put it on the website now. It's our regional kind of a list of where to go for help, advice, treatment centers, and it does include two newer offerings, virtual treatment centers, which is particularly attractive, I think, to people in Oregon, like in Southern Oregon, on the coast, people in sort of remote areas where, guess what, getting to Portland to go to treatment would be so disruptive, they almost can't do it. So trying to remove that barrier, there are a couple new virtual treatment centers. One is called Equip, and one is called Within Health, and they're on our regional list. And Therese, can you validate that that list includes resources in Washington? There's a question oh, about, does. okay, yes. there's a question about Clark County. I thought so too, thank you. Yes. Okay, next question. Um, is telehealth ever appropriate for eating disorder treatment and, it would, and when would that be appropriate? Well, I've been doing it since COVID started. I didn't think it would work as well as it has, but it has worked. Um, the people I worry about the most are people who could be medically fragile because I can't see them as well. I am trained to evaluate clinical signs and even do things like take a blood pressure, a pulse, and then of course weights. So now I have to rely on the treatment team. So people have to go to the doctor more frequently and maybe have an MA or a PA or nurse take those vitals for us. But I've been doing it, many people are doing it. And, and like I just mentioned, and we're doing it with, with good outcomes. Sometimes, and you, you will develop a sense, and we'll talk about this when we look at levels of care. When is it not working? I don't persist in treatment with somebody, if it's really clear things aren't working, I have to um, refer to higher levels of care. But getting back to telehealth, I just mentioned both Equip and the other group within health, they're all virtual and they're doing some amazing things. They're sending patients these digital scales so they can get a weight sent to them without the patient seeing the weight. Within Health also sends food. Yeah, no, they, technologically, I'm seeing some real sophistication happen in terms of telehealth because we don't know what this crazy virus is going to do. <laughs> We're hoping things settle down, but we don't we don't know. So I think telehealth is here to stay, and it's definitely happening with eating disorders. Okay, one last question about the pandemic, and then I'm going to defer two questions because I think they're related to your next lecture, but I'll say what those questions are so the people who ask them will know that. So the last question is, could a person develop an eating disorder as the result of the pandemic or who didn't already have a genetic predisposition to disordered eating? I haven't seen a lot of hard results, like just as a result of the pandemic. Usually there is some genetic aspect. There is something genetic that makes it possible to restrict 
to the level that somebody with anorexia nervosa restricts. The genetic part is you can see pretty clearly when every person I've ever had with anorexia nervosa and I've had a bunch say when they restrict, like when life becomes stressful and they restrict, restriction has a calming effect. I don't know about you, but restrictive food intake does not have a calming effect on me. Um, of course, that's my own personal thing, but most people it's just biologically, they don't go there, metabolically, they don't go there. And that biology and metabolism piece is linked to genetics. Um, could people develop other kinds of disordered eating? They could. I mean, I could see RFIT, for example, people afraid to go out because they're afraid of getting sick or getting COVID. And so maybe their food intake is reduced or restricted or odd. Um, but again, I think they're, the genetic part, I can't fully answer because the genetic aspects are still being so heavily researched. It's just a hot new area. So I think it's a great question to which we're still finding answers. Thank you, Therese. We're at time, so anyone who needs to go should feel free to go. The two additional questions that we're going to defer, I will say now, and then we're going to end the lecture for today. So the two additional questions are, um, what is your opinion of diet fads such as keto, Whole30, and others, and how they may contribute and coexist with eating disorders? And the other one has to do with food fears, clients with ARFID who have food sensitivities or allergies who then become afraid to eat mm -hmm. or may have conditions like irritable bowel syndrome, but don't yet know what foods they are sensitive to, so they avoid everything. How should a non-medical professional address these food fears? So we'll hold those two. Great questions. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Therese, okay. and thank you everyone for your attention today. Please remember to email Sam Haskins if you're not registered for CEUs and you wanted them. And we'll see you next month. July 13th. Lots of positive comments in the chat. Thanks, Therese. How do you think it went? Hey, Therese, this is Daphne. Can you hear me? I can. Hey, um, so we work together at Trillium and Pacific Source, and mm -hmm. I just wanted to say hi because I am now at Umpqua Health Alliance in Douglas we County. We are. Okay. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> you know, if you're doing work in Douglas County, please let me know. I'd love to um, get looped in you and be a part of that. Your contact info, because okay. definitely. Mm -hmm. I'll do it. Thank okay. you. That was wonderful. Good. Yeah. Great audience. Fantastic questions. Yeah, that was perfect. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Therese, this is Dimitri. Can I ask you a quick, quick question? It's just a yes sure. or no. Sure. Sure. Um, I work with the trans population, uh, population specifically. Are you going to be addressing this community? Yes. Wonderful. Melissa Grossman is going to be talking about LGBTQA plus issues and concerns and eating disorders. I was hoping I had Taylor Craven. Do you know Taylor Craven <clears throat> is a trans man who I was hoping to have do a lecture for us and he unfortunately wasn't able to. But yes, Melissa Grossman will be addressing that. Okay. Absolutely. Because thank you very much. High risk. Sure. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I was missing on your slide and I was it I, was. I, yeah. Thank Melissa, you. what's her last name again? Grossman. Grossman. Mm -hmm. okay. Dimitri, right. oh, this much. is Kathleen. I was messaging you to try to give you that information, but you must not have oh. seen it. So um, just oh, wanted to let you know I did answer your question. Uh, okay. <laughs> thank you. And thank uh -huh. you, Teresa. It was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Sam, I think you can turn off the recording. <laughs>